Hi, welcome to Foundations in Theology, Finding God in All Things. I'm Dr. Jennifer Henry, I'm a professor in the Department of Theology. We're excited to explore with you the Marc Chagall exhibit of the Bible, which is housed at Marquette University's Haggerty Museum of Art. One of the things that we think about in the Foundations of Theology course is how religion is embedded in culture. Today, we will be engaging the idea of art as a medium of theology. I've invited three guests to introduce us to Chagall's exhibit. First, I would like to welcome Lynn Schumo, the Curator for Academic Engagement at the Haggerty Museum. Professor Schumo, thank you so much for hosting us at the Haggerty. Could you share with us a little about the museum and Chagall's exhibit? I am Lynn Schumo. I am the Curator of Academic Engagement for the Haggerty Museum of Art. Uh, we are going to be talking about the Chagall Prints, which is um, a series that is part of our permanent collection. The museum owns a collection of about 6,000 works. That means they actually stay here. We rotate things in, up, in, in and out. Um, we have vaults downstairs, so when something isn't on display, it's in the vaults downstairs. Uh, but this is one of the pieces that we own, and what you're seeing here is just a selection of prints from a series by Mark Chagall called Bible. There's actually 105 prints in the series, so you're seeing just a small selection of the prints. Uh, Mark Chagall created this series for many, many years. He started in 1925 and didn't finish until about 1956. Thank you for that intro. How did Marquette acquire this fantastic exhibit? This uh, gift was given to the Hegarty by the Hegarty family, Patrick and Beatrice Hegarty. Uh, Mr. Hegarty was a graduate of Marquette and co-founder of Texas Instruments. Professor Schumo, how would you summarize the theme of Chagall's Bible series? If you had to um, sort of narrow down the meaning of this, Chagall is In your introduction, you spoke about the artistic medium of the Bible series. Could you explain the form of the print and the art of printmaking? Like said, these are prints. There are many different types of prints. Um, some printmaking is very, very simple and straightforward. Some of it is very, very complex. This particular type of printmaking is called etching. And I have sort of a simplified way of showing you what that means. Basically, you start with a plate, usually a copper plate. You can pretend this is copper. Um, the reason you use copper is that it is a very sort of soft metal. So you would start with your copper plate, and then you take the plate, and you cover it with this sort of waxy ground. The reason for doing that is it gives you a lot more flexibility for drawing, a lot more fluidity. Um, so you take then like a metal stylus and you can draw into this wax. Once you have your image, you take the plate um, and dip it into an acid bath. So what happens is the acid eats into the lines that have been drawn into the wax. And what you end up with, let me put a, some color behind there. What you end up with then is an incised plate. I don't know if you can see the image very well, but if I sort of scratch into it, you can see that there are lines that go below the surface. In printmaking, we call that intaglio. Um, anyway, so what you do then is you take the plate and you ink it. So you put ink all over the plate, you wipe away the excess, and you end up with ink embedded into those lines that have been incised into the plate. You're then ready to actually do the printmaking. So you take your plate, put a damp piece of paper on top of it, and you put it through a printing press. Basically what happens is a big, heavy metal drum comes down and pushes the paper into those inked incised lines. 
What you end up with then is, pull this off, and you have a print of the uh, ink image. You can see that the print is a mirrored image of what is on the plate. But anyway, one of the beautiful things about printmaking um, is that you can do this over and over and over again. So what we have here in the series is each one of these prints was printed 100 times. If you come up closely, you can see that it says 65 over 100. That means that we have the 65th set out of 100 sets that were done. Something that's really unique about our series is that it's hand colored. So after the black and white printing was done, Chagall went in and put coloring in each one of these. There, like I said, there was 100 sets of uh, the Bible series created and there's very, very few that were hand colored. So we have a really special Thank you set. so much, Professor Shumo, for introducing us to the Haggerty Museum and to the Chagall exhibit. Next, I would like to welcome Dr. Deirdre Dempsey from the Department of Theology, who has agreed to introduce us to Mark Chagall and specifically to some of the themes in some of the prints from the exhibit. Hello, I'm Deirdre Dempsey. I teach in the Department of Theology and I'm one of the honors program uh, professors, along with Dr. Henry, Dr. Hills, and Dr. Ross. So um, the four of us will be teaching, I think, seven sections of uh, honors program Theology 1001. And it's my uh, privilege to talk to you about Mark Chagall. Uh, who he was, a little bit about his, his historical background, something about the sort of art that um, he's famous for. And he is famous. I suspect a number of you have heard the name Mark Chagall. I would say that if you're talking about 20th century Western artists, he's one of the top five, right? He'd be up there with um, Pablo Picasso, and Salvador Dali. Um, and those of you who uh, live in the Chicago area, maybe you've been to the Art Institute, into the Modern Wing, and you've seen a couple of his very famous paintings. He worked in a lot of different um, media. Um, as Lynn has explained, prints, but he also did paintings, he did designs for stained glass, he did uh, designs for tapestry. Anyway, at the Art Institute, maybe you've seen his white crucifixion, um, of which there are two, he, he painted two white crucifixions, one's in the Art Institute, and then the other uh, painting of his in the Art Institute is um, the praying Jew. You, many of you, even if you haven't heard his name, you've probably seen some of his paintings, very colorful usually, um, often um, with uh, different um, chickens or goats or animals that he would have seen uh, when he was growing up in the, in the little city in which he lived. Um, a lot of times floating figures. Um, there's often a bit of whimsy about his, uh, about his paintings or about a number of his paintings. So, um, who was he? Well, Chagall is born in the 1880s in a, uh, a place that is now the country of Belarus. Very much in the news lately, huh? Belarus, um, lots of protests uh, against uh, the government there. Anyway, in the time that Chagall is born, in the 1880s, that's part of the Russian Empire. So you, you don't have the Soviet Union yet, right? Um, the Tsar is uh, the power in Russia. And he's born in a small city called Viterbsk um, that had a very large Orthodox Jewish population. And that's, that's uh, the, the environment 
in which Chagall grew up. Um, his family was uh, Orthodox Jews, they were Orthodox Jews, um, Hasidic Jews, and um, he would have gone with his uh, family to synagogue quite frequently. Um, so from early on, he heard all sorts of Bible stories. And as Lynn says, that's what this is. This is part of the Bible series. Now obviously, he's Jewish, so when um, Chagall's talking Bible series, uh, that would be what Christians would refer to as the Old Testament. In a, in a Jewish context, you'd simply call it the Bible or the Hebrew Bible. So he's uh, born in Viterbsk. He gets out of Viterbsk pretty early. Um, when he's about 18, he leaves to go um, uh, into Russia for um, uh, art lessons. And at some point, because he's discovered his talent, and so um, he goes to St. Petersburg uh, uh, for art school. At some point, still very young, in his 20s, he uh, goes to France. And actually, he's going to really, France is really going to be the place that he spends most of his life. Um, he does come back uh, to Viterbsk, and he gets trapped there for a few years. Um, uh, and he works for the nascent uh, Soviet Union uh, for a while until um, he realizes that that's just not for him and he goes to France again. And he's going to spend uh, the rest of his life in France except for a period of time during World War II when he um, comes to these United States um, uh, uh, helped by some artist friends in in New York City in order to escape what would be, have been certain death uh, at the hands of the, of the Nazis. Anyway, um, so when he leaves Viterbsk, he kind of leaves the, the practice of his uh, Jewish religion behind. Uh, so he has, um, you know, he's, he might not go to the synagogue with any great regularity, uh, after that, but he never leaves his uh, love of Judaism and his interest in his roots behind. And um, that shows itself very much in these, um, uh, in this, in the work in the Bible series uh, that he's, uh, he's pulling from the stories that he heard in the synagogue and around the table. Biblical stories, but also stories that um, sort of rift off of the biblical uh, uh, narratives. There are some other things about his upbringing that show themselves very clearly in, uh, in his work. He tends to shy away from actually depicting God. And so instead of the figure of God, he will um, maybe have angels or um, uh, uh, print out in Hebrew the name of God, for example, right here in this um, uh, burning bush uh, print. Um, or I would argue that he uses the color yellow um, to, uh, to indicate divine presence. Um, so um, in that way, he remains true to his Jewish roots. Um, he's also, uh, he's a kind of artist, he dabbles in a lot of different sort of isms, right? But one of the um, isms of the art world that he dabbles in is surrealism. So he's very interested, and this comes up in his art all the time, whether it's paintings or prints or whatever, he's very interested in what might bubble up in your memory or what, might, what you might dream about, um, and uh, what just strikes you as important. That's something that the surrealists, they thought that things that you dreamt about or bubbled up in your unconscious, they were uh, really significant for your, uh, for your development. And so you're gonna see in these prints um, things that reflect 
things that he's rem remembering from his childhood. So for example, um, he grew up in an Orthodox Jewish household where the men dressed in a certain way. So you'll see when he portrays folks in, um, uh, like, uh, in these Bible stories. So here's a, his print about the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham. Okay, he portrays Abraham dressed as his uncle would have dressed or uh, his father would have dressed. So that's very much what a surrealist might do, right? Pulling up from memory, from things he knows. Uh, uh, when he thinks of Abraham, he thinks about the men who surrounded him uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his... Dr. Dempsey, you say that Chagall refers to his childhood and his Jewish upbringing in his prints. In one way, he's bringing his cultural perspective to the biblical narrative. Can you share a specific example of that? This is another really good example of what I was just talking about, that, uh, that Chagall pulls from his memory of his, of his childhood when he's depicting um, Bible uh, stories here. So this uh, print depicts the crossing of the Jordan um, uh, by Joshua. So Joshua is one of Moses' lieutenants who takes over, who uh, becomes the authority figure, the leader, after Moses dies. And in the uh, first, uh, yeah, in the book of Joshua, um, you have the crossing of the Jordan. And it's depicted in the Bible as Joshua uh, and his followers carrying the Ark of the Covenant across the, the Jordan River. So Ark of the Covenant, if you've ever seen um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I know is a really old movie, but uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark depicts what the Ark of the Covenant looked like. Its, its construction is described in the biblical book of, of Exodus. Um, it's a box. It's a box that, according to the narrative in the Bible, contains uh, the tablets of the, the Ten Commandments. Okay, that's not, when you look at this, that's not really what's being depicted here. Um, and again, Chagall is going back to his, to his childhood, when he would have sat uh, in the synagogue and looked for, you know, time and time again, up at um, the curtain, the Torah curtain, that behind that would have been the, the niche that, control, that contained the Torah scroll that would be taken out. So for example, at bar, uh, bar Mitzvah is taken out and read from. And so um, in uh, Eastern Europe, there were so many of these synagogues that would have had these curtains um, covering this uh, uh, this, this niche in the wall where the uh, Torah scroll was held. And that's, that's what's being depicted here, one of those curtains. Great example of um, Chagall using his, um, his memory. Chagall's context is the Second World War and the persecution of the Jewish people. How does Chagall's work speak to this anti-Semitism? One last thing um, that underscores how Chagall was aware of, um, of the anti-Semitism uh, of his time and, and before his time. And it has to do with actually the depictions of Moses throughout these um, 105 uh, etchings. Uh, I did a quick count and Moses is depicted, and I think it's 16 of these 105, so you can see what an important figure Moses is. Okay, if you see Moses here, notice that oh, on his head you have these rays of light, rays of light uh, coming out. Over here you have another uh, depiction of Moses receiving the commandments of the law, um, also rays of light. Okay. Every depiction of Moses has these rays of light. So what's going on? Well, in this comes from 
early in the book of Exodus, this story, this is, this is the story of the commissioning of Moses. Uh, much, much later, uh, there's a story in the, um, in the Bible about Moses coming down from the mountain when he's encountered God, and it reads um, that because of, his, of Moses' encounter with God, um, his face shone and had rays of light coming off of it. Okay, so Chagall decides to, even way before that part of the narrative, to depict Moses with rays of light. Some of that has to do, I believe, with Chagall trying to combat a certain image that was very prevalent in, um, uh, in churches at the time in France, where he was living. Um, uh, and um, pretty frequently, you'll see old depictions of Moses, not with rays of light, but depicted with horns. And that is a depiction that is based on a mistranslation of the Hebrew by an early Bible translator by the name of Jerome, St. Jerome. And Jerome was translating from the Hebrew into Latin to provide an authoritative text uh, in his time, in the end of the um, 300s. And he comes across the section where it talks about um, Moses descending from the mountain. And St. Jerome misreads a word that was really easy to misread, um, uh, the, the, root, the word that would uh, indicate uh, rays of light, Jerome read as the word for horns. And so he translates that as Moses was horned when he came down from his encounter with God. And that got into a lot of um, artistic depictions. Some of you might know Michelangelo's um, uh, uh, famous statue of Moses um, that's in the church called St. Peter's in Chain, St. Peter in Chains in Rome, um, and you have the horned Moses. Okay, that that translation was a mistake by Jerome. Um, he didn't intend that, but it got into the Christian European artworks and led to, frankly, it was part of the anti-Semitism. Of the, of the Middle Ages and to the uh, Renaissance and beyond. So what Chagall is trying to do here, I think, is to push back against that, because he knows that that was an incorrect translation, and he's trying to emphasize the rays of light that came off of Moses's. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dempsey. Our next guest is also a member of the theology department, Dr. Karen Ross. Dr. Ross, would you be willing to have a conversation with us about Chagall's print called The Creation of Man and how that print connects to some of the conversations the foundations in theology classes are having about the Genesis narrative? Hi, I'm Dr. Ross and I am part of the Honors Theology faculty and we will be talking about Mark Chagall's series, The Bible, that the Haggerty is very lucky to have. I'm going to be focusing on this first print, which is called The Creation of Man. And biblical scholar Phyllis Tribble offers that it be called The Creation of Human, because the word for Adam, which is the Hebrew word, uh, means earth creature. The root of Adam comes from the Hebrew word for clay. So we look here that the creation of humanity is depicted by Mark Chagall. And we talked about in class how a myth is an imaginative story that uses symbols to speak about a reality, but this reality is beyond comprehension. So myths speak about moral and spiritual truths. Mark Chagall obviously wasn't there at the beginning of creation, and so he's using his imagination, influenced by his Jewish culture, in order to interpret how humans came to be, how creation happened. So in the print, we can see how some imaginative elements are there. 
So there's a little bit of yellow at the top where we can see there's a tetragrammaton, which in Hebrew uh, is the symbol for Yahweh, uh, for God. And the yellow there, we could interpret that as divinity and that the divine is acting upon the human. The human is shaded in yellow as well. These are sources of debate, the colors. Um, we also see that there is an angel that's carrying the human. Um, there wasn't an angel in the Genesis story. And you may remember not reading about that. But Chagall is using what he knows about his own Jewish culture, which there are some extra biblical sources that talk about angels. And so he's using his imagination to depict a reality that is beyond his understanding and beyond all of our understandings. So when you look at this, I encourage you to look for themes or symbols that might be pointing to a greater reality. So maybe you want to interpret the fact that the human is passive in the angel's arms as an interpretation that humans are vulnerable and that God and divinity, is, divine action is carrying us into this world. Um, you may interpret the angel looking backwards as looking back in history. There are many interpretations to Chagall's prints, and just know that his own Jewish culture was influencing this particular print. In Hebrew, or in Jewish culture, uh, it is not seen as appropriate, as idolatrous to try to picture God, and so that's why the Tetragrammaton is there because that is the one thing that we should not try to picture in our image. Dr. Ross, thank you so much for that invitation to explore the creation of man. You know, as I listen to you and to Dr. Dempsey, this invites me to think about theology, both as the study of the revelation of God and also as an understanding of faith or thinking about how humans respond to that revelation. You know, Dr. Dempsey spoke about Chagall being a surrealist artist and how that movement formed him to use his imagination to release images from his unconscious mind in his work. She talked about Chagall's Jewish upbringing and familial experiences in the Ukraine shaping his expression of the biblical narrative. I think, Dr. Ross, that what you're showing us is that this very movement is also inviting us to bring to Chagall's prints our experiences and our knowledge of these biblical narratives. So I want to take a few minutes to play along too. Um, like you, I have a theological interest in the Genesis creation narrative um, and explore this with students in our foundation class. One of the things that we look at in class is how to make sense of the fact that there are two narratives of the creation of man, right? The first one tells the story of God creating man in his image. And God said, let, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. God created man in his image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. But then there's also this second story that tells the story of God forming man from clay and then the woman from the rib of Adam. We of course are not the first people to recognize this two-story reality. In fact, both Jewish and Christian theologians have been trying to make sense of this for years. One way that these traditions make sense of the two creation problem is by filling in the gaps. Chagall might have been familiar with one of these solutions. In Judaism, there is a collection of rabbinic texts that incorporate folklore, historical anecdotes, moral exhortations, and practice of practical advice. Some of this Agadah was collected into a book called The Legends of the Jews. These biblical legends from the Mishnah and Talmud and Midrash oftentimes seek to fill in the gaps of the biblical narrative. Like, why are there two stories? Or who is that us that's making man? One story that explains the us as God talking with the angels and of seeing the angels um, as part of creation, because God sends the angels to the four corners of the earth to collect the clay from which Adam would be formed. That way, no matter where man died, he would return to his origins. So if a man was born in the east and died in the west, he would still return to the dust as he had been formed from all four corners of the earth. So I wonder if Chagall knew this story. Um, I actually don't know. But I do know 
that there is no angel in the creation narrative. But Chagall certainly includes one in this print. I also know that I know this story, right? I know this story from the legends of the Jews. And so when I come to this print and to the biblical narrative, I'm using that story to fill in the gaps. I actually think this is why I'm so excited to welcome the Foundations in Theology courses to the Haggerty and to the exploration of the Chagall exhibit. I encourage you to encounter Chagall's work and the biblical narrative with the mind of a surrealist. What are your experiences and memories of the biblical narrative? What questions do you bring to the stories? And in what way does Chagall show the narrative speaking into his own narrative? In what ways do Chagall's prints and the biblical narrative speak into our own narratives? I really want to thank Dr. Ross and Dr. Dempsey, Dr. Hills, and Professor Shumo for working with the Honors Foundation team to create this shared activity. On behalf of us all, we want to welcome you to the Haggerty Museum of Art and the exploration of theology and art.